Okay, we left off last time. Uh, Shadow of the Past. Frodo says he wants to have the ring destroyed. Gandalf tells him, you know, what must be done. And Frodo offers to take it. He doesn't offer to take it all the way to Mount Doom, but agrees to at least leave the Shire so that the Shire will be saved, protected, etc. Gandalf suggests that they make for Rivendell um, and that they should do it soon. He also gives Frodo a companion because he catches Sam eavesdropping on him. And Sam's all excited. He says, what, me? Go and see elves and such, you know. Whereas it's supposed to be a punishment for Sam, it's like, you know, icing on the cake. So, Frodo agrees to leave. He sells Bag in, and in the chapter, three is company. Um, they're making their way from the Shire to, or from Hobbiton to Buckleberry, and in the evening, they run into elves, pages 78 and 79, all right? Notice in the book, they do not have black riders pursuing them. They are not hiding under tree roots, and black riders can't sense them, blah, blah. I mean, yes, there are black riders in the Shire. They do see them from a distance, etc. They hear their shriek or whatever. Uh, but they see these elves, 78, 79, and Frodo talks with them, 80 and 81, and Gildor tells Frodo, I know, I know about what you're doing. I, I know what you have with you. Don't worry, secret safe with me. You know, we've kind of put the word out so that other like creatures and other beings, let's say, favorable to you will, you know, help you, etc., etc. Okay, they've talked about the Black Riders. Um, Gildor says, we know what they are. Frodo doesn't know what the Black Riders are. He doesn't know that they are some of the nine um, kings of men who had rings of their own, okay? So they make their way, they keep talking, they make their way on and uh, skip chapter four, sh shortcut to mushrooms in the meeting of Farmer Maggot and stuff. Chapter five, a conspiracy on math. They finally get their way, um, make their way all the way to Crick Hollow, the new house that Frodo's going to live in with Sam as his, essentially his butler slash servant. And what happens while there? Well, the title of the chapter. A conspiracy unmasked. What's the conspiracy? Sam, Mary, and Pippin join Frodo. Sam, Mary, and Pippin are going to accompany Frodo on his journey to Rivendell. What about Fatty Bulger? He's going to stay. Yeah, he's going to stay at Crick Hollow. So, how do, they, how do they decide to go to Rivendell? Do they take the main road? No, they take a shortcut. And they go through the Old Forest, Chapter 6. They stop by a river. And Merry and Pippin start to get eaten by a tree, a willow tree. And Frodo tries to burn the tree to get them out, and the tree clamps harder and harder on them. And they are rescued by Tom Bombadil, page 119 and following. Okay. Tom Bombadil takes them to his house, chapter 7. And they stay there. They have some strange dreams and stuff. And one evening... Middle of the chapter, I'm trying to get through stuff really fast because we're um, behind. In fact, I'm, I'm really debating whether I should even talk about Tom Bobadil because Tom Bobadil doesn't really f count. He, he doesn't really do anything in the course of the novel. He, he doesn't serve any larger ultimate purpose. Um, in fact, before Tolkien published The Lord of the Rings, he published a collection of poetry called The Adventures of Tom Bobadil. Tom, Tom Bombadil did not, quote-unquote, exist in Middle-earth, per se. He, he kind of had his own place, and Tolkien just kind of drops him in here, all right? But the reason we are going to discuss him is because Gandalf and Elrond and others 
discuss Tom Bombadil in the chapter we are going to get, the Council of Elrond, because they think maybe they can give the ring to him. Okay, page 131. So they're at his house, they've had dinner, they're smoking their pipes, they're drinking, and Tom Bombadil is kind of telling them a history of the world. All right? And we're told at the top of 131, they drift kind of in and out of consciousness. He talks to them about the Barrel Whites. Okay? Um, now, they've not met any Barrel Whites yet. This is a little bit of foreshadowing. When they caught his words again, he'd now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory, beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider, the seas flowed straight to the western shore, and still on and back Tom went singing out into ancient starlight. When only the elf sires were awake. In Tolkien's cosmology, as I said, you have Ir not Ur, I did it again. You have Iru Iluvatar, okay? And Iru Iluvatar creates these beings called the Ainur, the equal angels, okay? Creates them, um, they're kind of like the product of his thought. And he tells them, you know, sing, essentially. And they sing. And he gives form and substance to what they sing. That is, everything that is made is made through their singing, okay? One of the first things they sing is... Elves. Okay. Elves. And their elves are the first, other than the Ainur, created sentient beings. They live on a world called Arda, Earth. Right? They're the oldest sentient beings. The second born after them are humans. And then you have dwarves. And then somewhere along the line, hobbits and, you know, other things, okay? So Tom sings back to when these beings were first awakened. Because when they were sung into creation, you had all these elf bodies, not all these elf bodies, these, some elf bodies, sleeping on the ground. And at one point, it's like they're tapped on the head and they wake up. Song. Tom sings about that, when they wake up. But he doesn't stop there. Notice he's going backwards in time. Then suddenly stopped. They saw that he nodded if he has fallen asleep, and the hobbits are, you know, sat still before him. It seemed as if under the spell of the word, his words, the wind had gone, clouds had dried up, you know, everything, darkness had come from the east and west, and all the sky was filled with a light of white stars. And Frodo kind of is like, Eh, what's that? Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? Well, that's an interesting question. Who are you, alone, that is not in relationship to anybody else, yourself, the real I, the real ego, nameless? Why? Why nameless? What does everyone's name say about them? <coughs> Every individual's name says, at the very least, this thing about that individual. And the same thing applies to every individual. They were born? Keep going. Yes, you're entirely right. And that means what? You were given that name? Keep going. <coughs> None of us chose to are independent. None of us are independent. Why? Dependent means what? Okay, just look at this part. Comes from that. Something that is pendant is what? It's hanging. Dependent means out of, away from, connected to that hanging. Independent means I don't hang from anything else. Well, if if something is hanging, then there's got to be something up here it's hanging from. Okay? To be independent is to not be hanging from anything. It's to not be connected to anything. The name that we all receive, 
doesn't matter if it's the same name or not. What that name indicates is I exist in relation to something else. That's it. I am not totally on my own. I did not spring myself into being. Okay? Tom says, don't you know me yet? Who are you, yourself? Who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? I think Tom is saying, I know who I am, alone, myself, not named by anybody else. Now, Tolkien doesn't say this in any of his letters. Tolkien suggests, in fact, that Tom, that Tom is a spirit of pacifism, kind of embodied. I think he's more than that. I wonder, I don't have any proof for it, I wonder if Tom is not a manifestation of this, Eru Iluvatar. Because one of the definitions of the word G-O-D is self-existent, not created. Okay? After all, in the Old Testament story, in Genesis, when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai because he sees the burning bush and he goes to the burning bush and the burning bush or the voice in the burning bush tells Moses, go back to Egypt, set my people free. He's like, whoa, 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 hold on here. Who am I supposed to say sent me? What's the response God gives? Tell them I am that I am. What does that mean? I be. All of you, uh-uh. All of us, uh-uh. We all depend. All created, so to speak. Tom might be suggesting, uh, the reason I know all this, I was there. Okay? He goes on. But you are young and I am old. Eldest. That's what I am. What's the est mean? You don't get any older than this, okay? Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Now, he probably means in this location, the river, the withy window, or the brandy wine, brandy wine, and the trees, the trees of the old forest. Okay, so maybe it's a really old forest. So maybe Tom's been around 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 years. Could be. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. Okay, now that's going a lot farther back. I remember the first rain drop that fell from the clouds. That's pretty old. <clears throat> he made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. Well, who are the big people? These two. He made paths before they arrived. That means he's not one of them. So that when they woke up, they said, hmm, there's a road. <laughs> Who made that road? He goes on. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. In Tolkien's cosmology, when the world was first created, when Arda was first created, it was flat. It was a flat disk. And you had land over here, let's say, and you had water here, and you had an island here, and you had more land over here. And you could take a boat, and you could go across the water to this land. This land was called the Uttermost West, okay? So that you could go across here, and this is where the gods dwelt. Even in England today, when someone dies, they have a euphemism. He's gone west. Okay. Kind of over this place. Tom says, I remember when the world was like this. Read the Silmarillion, you can find out how this became this. And you can no longer get on a boat here and just on your own arrive here. You don't do this. Okay. It is possible, but you have to have the right mariners and 
pilot, so to speak, with you. He goes on. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the dark lord came from outside. Well, when did the dark lord come from outside? By the way, that dark lord, that's not Sauron. That's Melkor, a.k.a. Morgoth. Think of him as Satan. He says, I remember Arda as it was before the darkness came. Well, when was that? Almost after the beginning of time. Almost immediately after the beginning of time. So when did Melkor come in? When Uru Iluvatar essentially said, okay guys, here's what you've done, now go, now go kind of watch. Right? Because when the Ainu are seeing everything into existence, this guy Melkor, he kind of like says, yeah, I don't like the notes of this symphony. I want it to go this way. So he introduces a new note. And it's really bad. And it makes the symphony jangle. So Iluvatar stops them. And he goes, okay, sing again. They sing again. Morgoth, Morgoth does that again. Iluvatar stops again. Now he's getting pissed. <laughs> they sing again. The third time, Iluvatar stands up off his throne, and he says, to show you, Melkor, that you can't do anything to thwart my will, now let me show you what you guys have just done. You thought you were just singing a song. Uh-oh. You did what? You just created the universe and everything that happened happens in it, with one exception, us. We have total free will, according to Tolkien's cosmology. What they say doesn't control us. Okay? So, Melkor, at that moment, leaves the presence of Uriel Luvatar and goes down into the world. Why? Because he's still going to try and screw it up even more. Tom is saying, I remember that. Well, who the hell is Tom Bombadil then? Because it's a pretty interesting question. But we don't get the answer. So, the next morning, nearly the next morning, Tom sends them on their way. And he warns them. Yes? Yeah, it's very, very similar. Tolkien's, again, Tolkien's Catholic. He says, The Lord of the Rings is fundamentally a religious and philosophical work, more so in the revising than in the creation. That is, as he revises, he can't help but have some of his Catholic belief come out. Well, this story that's told in the Silmarillion, this is a lot older than the Lord of the Rings. Okay? And if you're going to have a creation story, you got to have a creator. Tolkien doesn't think, you know, just magically, 14 and a half billion years ago, boom, and everything happened, right? So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of Christian elements in that, more so than in the Lord of the Rings. But what was one of the things he told them about? The Barrows and the Barrow Whites. Barrows are burial mounds. Barrow Whites are the creatures that live in them. Go to Stonehenge. Take a study abroad course. Go to, go to England. Go to Stonehenge. Look at the pretty rocks. And then turn your back to the rocks and look all 360 degrees around that stone circle. And you will see in almost every degree, every point of the compass, you will see, if you look closely, the burial mound. They're all over the place there. Okay? Several thousand years old. At some point in time, every one of those probably had a body and treasure in it. They've all been looted over the centuries, okay? So, he warns them, don't go up on the barrows, and if you do go up on the barrows and you see a standing stone, stay away from it. So what do the hobbits do? They, go up on the they do exactly the opposite, okay? And they get captured. They get captured, they get taken inside one of the barrows, page 141. Frodo is the only one who still has any of his senses about him. 
And he thinks, you know, I could leave. Yeah, they'd all be dead, but, you know, they'd understand. I could leave. And he remembers Tom Bombadil, and he sings, and Tom Bombadil comes and rescues them. Okay? He takes them out. They've all been dressed in different clothing. He takes them out of the barrel, and he takes everything that was in the barrel, all the quote-unquote treasure out, and exposes it essentially in the sunlight. And then he does something that's pretty important later on. He gives them each a weapon. Okay? From this barrel. Now, who were the people buried in these mounds? Who died to be buried in these mounds? Kings and soldiers, their armies. What kings and soldiers? Who were they fighting? Tom tells them they were fighting a guy called the Witch King of Angmar. Well, who's the Witch King of Angmar? Sauron. Nope. Morgoth? Nope. Lower. He is the chief king of men that Sauron gave a ring to. In other words, he's the captain of the nine black riders. So the people that died who were buried in these barrows were people who were fighting against him. The weapons that Tom Bombadil pulls out of there okay, were swords that were initially forged thousands of years previously for one purpose, to defeat him. So they had spells woven into them. As they were being forged, it was like, kill the witch king of Angmar, kill the witch king of Angmar, kind of a thing. Okay? Why is this important? Because of something that happens in Return of the King. Third volume of the Lord of the Rings. Okay, So Tom rescues them. And now he figures these guys are kind of dumb. I better see them all the way till they get on Interstate 24 and I can point to Murfreesboro and they know how to get there. Okay? <clears throat> Meaning, get them on the east-west road and say, there's Bree. Don't go off the road. Just walk on the road and you'll be safe. So they go to the sign of the Prancing Pony. A pub. An inn. What happens there? Real briefly, they get rooms, and then the old fat pub keeper invites them to come to the common room where everybody is. Why? Because we don't get hobbits from the Shire every now and then. And it'd be nice to have some talk here, hear what's going on, maybe tell a story or two. So they go in, describe the four hobbits. Four? Yeah. Describe the four hobbits. Who's the eldest? It's Frodo. Okay. Who's next eldest? Is it Sam? Is it Mary? Is it Pippin? Who is it definitely not? Pippin. Pippin's the youngest. Okay. And what's Pippin doing when Frodo makes his way into the common room? Pippin's getting along with everybody, and he's had a few beers to drink, and his tongue's getting a little loose, and he's starting to talk. Well, Frodo has, meanwhile, sat in the back of the pub next to a guy named Strider. And what does Strider tell him? You better put a cork in him, or he's about to give away your secret. So Frodo, rather than putting a cork in him, Frodo jumps up on a table and starts singing and dancing. And while he's singing and dancing, he shoves his hands in his pockets and disappears. Why? Because the ring is in his pocket. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried this. Take a ring, put it in your pocket, and just throw your hands in. It's not easy for that ring to just automatically slide right on your finger. What's this showing us? Thinking on its own, basically. The ring's trying to make itself known, okay? Frodo disappears. When he next reappears, he's sitting next to Strider again. And Strider calls him by his real name, okay? Skip to chapter 10. They go off with Strider. Bartim and Butterbur comes in. He kind of warns Frodo about this Strider, because what's he look like? 
He does not look like Vigo Mortensen. Why? Because Vigo Mortensen is too handsome. He's too good looking. He can splatter all the mud in the world you want on Vigo Mortensen. He'd still look like Vigo Mortensen. How should Aragorn or Strider look? Where does he spend his days? Outside. For the most part, outside. And nights? Outside. For how long? Anybody know how old he is? He's 87. Right now, in the novel. Aragorn is 87. But 87 on Aragorn, because he's a descendant of the men of Western Essa, Looks more like maybe 47 or 57 in us, okay? But he's still starting to show some age. He's got gray streaks in his hair. What else? What about his clothes? Tattered. Tattered, stained, probably a little smelly, okay? And then... Barliman gives Frodo a letter. When was Barliman supposed to give Frodo the letter? He was supposed to send it out the next day. He was supposed to send it the next day. The letter was written midsummer day. Okay. When is this? This is now early October or late September. Because Frodo did not leave until when? Did not leave the Shire until when? September. His birthday. Okay. September 22nd. So, he gives Frodo the letter, and he has a PS. He has a double PS. Make sure it's the real Strider. And there's a poem that goes with Strider's name. And Frodo says, why didn't you tell me? Did you were a friend of Gandalf's? It would have saved time. Really? Would it? How stupid are you? Well, yeah, I'm a friend of Gandalf's. What kind of proof is he going to give? Okay. He says, I didn't know anything of this letter. Bottom of 170. For all I knew, I had to persuade you to trust me without proofs if I was to help you. Okay. And Sam, notice, 171 says, whoa, 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 time out. How do we know you are the real Strider? He says, you never mentioned Gandalf till this letter came out. You might be a play-acting spy, for all I can see, trying to get us to go with you. You might have done it in the real stride and took his clothes. So what do you what do you say to that? Well, that's pretty good logic, right? Sam, the quote-unquote simple, uneducated gardener, because Mary and Pippin, they're kind of like, you know, minor aristocrats, as is Frodo. Sam, low-born commoner. He's the one who applies some good common sense. And what does Strider say? You're a stout fellow, but I'm afraid. Here's my only answer. If I weren't the real Strider, and he stands up, and he's like 6'2", six 6'5", six he says, I could kill you all right now. See, I'm kind of, you know, metaphorically backs up a little bit. But I am him. And if I was after the ring, I could have it now. So, Frodo says, you know, I wanted to trust you, bottom of 171. I mean, one of his enemies, Sauron's, spies, well, I, I, he'd seem fairer and feel fouler. He'd seem he would come across as being more pleasing to the eyes, and my gut would tell me, don't trust him. And Aragorn goes, oh, okay, so I get it. So I feel fair. But I seem foul, meaning you don't like my looks. That's not what I do. Goes, no, no, it's okay. Okay. So we now have Aragorn slash Strider to help. Do they really understand what that means? Do they really understand who Aragorn is? No. No. Sam never really understands until almost the end of the novel. Okay. Chapter 11, Knife in the Dark. They leave Prancing Pony. Why? Why don't they stay there a few days, catch their breath, relax a little bit, put on some weight, eat a bunch of good grub? 
That very night, black riders are in Bree. How do we know? Where was Mary during all this stuff going on with Strider? He was doing, uh, out taking control. He went out for a walk. And what happens? One of the black riders, or two of them, catch him. And they kind of probe his mind somehow. He doesn't tell them anything. So Aragorn says, all right, this isn't good. They make up false beds in a room. They all share another room together. And in the morning, they go into the room with the false beds to find out what's been happened, what's happened to the dummies. They've been slashed. So by the time they leave, it's now mid-morning, and all of Bree comes out to see them off. They wanted to leave before sunrise without anybody knowing. So they make their way, and they're going to make their way to a place called Weathertop. That is, a mountain in the area that, from whose peak they can get a nice broad survey of the whole land. But it's also on the way to Rivendell. Okay? So on the evening of the 5th of October, page 185, they're talking about the path and stuff, and... Aragorn says there's no barrow on Weathertop. That is, you don't need to worry about, you know, standing stone and barrows. Don't worry about that. He says, the men of the West built a fortress on this mountain, but there's not much of it left. Okay. Tells them what the mountain was for. It was a signal fire, essentially. It was used to signal when danger was coming. And we're told, a little over halfway down, it is told that Elendil stood there watching for the coming of Gilgalad out of the west in the days of the last alliance. Now, when we get to that here, what might Aragorn as well be speaking? Latin, Swahili? Because do we know who Gilgalad is? Nope. Do we know what out of the west means? Nope. Do we know what the last alliance was? Nope. Other than the little bit we were told in the chapter of the shadow of the past. Because in that chapter, Gandalf said just a tiny about it. Right? Talked about the rings being forged in a ring, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to hear a lot more about that in a moment. Okay? So, Mary asks, who is Gilgalad? And suddenly Sam starts singing. They're all surprised. Sam says, I learned it from Mr. Bilbo, et cetera, et cetera. Strider says, he didn't make it up. That's from a much, much, much longer poem. I'm trying to remember if this is one you can now buy as a separate book. The Fall of Gilgalad. I think it might be. Tolkien's uh, youngest son, who edited all of his stuff and came out with the Silmarillion in 1977, then re-edited everything and came out with the 12-volume history of Middle Earth. And he's been going back and he's been pulling select stories out of all that and republishing it. You know, Tale of Baron and Luthien, which is one of the great love stories. Um, I'm pretty sure he's done The Fall of Gilgalad. Okay? So, they make their way to Weathertop and what do they see? Scorch marks. And they find a stone and on the stone... There are some scratches. And Aragorn says, or Strider says, I think I know what this means. I think this means Gandalf was here, and he was here on the night of October the 3rd. The one mark means G, and the three probably means the third. Okay. So what happens while they're up there? They see the Black Riders first. They see them in the distance, and Aragorn's like, oh, crap. Why? Because they were standing up. If they could see the Black Riders, the reverse is true. <laughs> because they're standing up and what's behind them? Light. Nice big silhouettes, in other words. Okay? So, they go off the down top of the mountain. They're down into a little dell. They build a big fire. And they're attacked. But just before they're attacked... Mary's kind of like, tell us more about Gilgalad. I, I feel like it'll make me feel better. Okay. 
Tell us, you, mo you know more of that story? He goes, yeah, I, I, I do. And Frodo knows some of it. Why? Because it concerns him also. Okay? So 191. Frodo says, yeah. And he starts to talk about Gilgalad and starts to talk about Elendil and how they went into it. No, 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 don't talk about that. <laughs> he was about to say Mordor, Sauron's kind of kingdom, and you don't talk about that at night when his servants are around. It's kind of like a way of going, oh, Satan, come on. So Sam says, tell us another tale. And Aragorn says, okay. He says, I'll tell you one. I'll tell you about the tale of Tenuvial. He says, it's an old tale, but it is said, as are all the tales of Middle Earth. Yet it might lift up your heart. Why are all the tales, according to Aragorn, of Middle Earth sad? Why aren't any of them happy stories, joyful stories? What does Middle Earth lack? Okay. That, at least within the Christian tradition of our world, and some other religious traditions, I think it would be fair to add, um, what does Middle Earth lack that some religious traditions in our world don't lack? Bingo. And afterlife. Hope. Hope for more. Hope for something better. Hope that this all means something. Okay? So, he sings this song. I should tell you, Baron and Luthien, you know, I mentioned, you know, great love story in, in Middle Earth. Baron, Tolkien. Luthien, his wife. If you go to the cemetery outside Oxford, um, where they are buried, you see, um, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, Baron. Edith Louise Pratt Tolkien, or something like that, Luthien. He considered her his Luthien. I don't know whether she considered him as Baron, probably, you know. Um, but it was their relationship that became the model of this, okay? So he finishes it, the Black Riders show up, and what does Frodo do? Why? Well, they tell him to, for one thing. I mean, they say, the ring, the ring. He puts it on. He can no longer see Sam, Mary, Pippin, and Strider, clearly. But what does he see? He sees the Black Riders, clearly. Why? Because he's now in their realm. Bingo. What did Gandalf say will happen to a mortal who wears the ring too much? The person will fade and live eternally in kind of like that limbo, type area. limbo or that kind of existence. A wraith. All right. That's what all the nine riders are. So when he puts on the ring, it's kind of like he crosses over into the unseen world, if you want. They can see him clearly. So the captain of the nine tries to stab him. Frodo calls out. Well, Elbereth Gilthoniel, which is, according to some scholars, that's kind of like saying Hail Mary full of grace. Elbereth Gilthoniel is the queen of the gods. Her husband is named Manwe. He's the king of, think of him kind of like, you know, Zeus and uh, Hera. Okay? So, Frodo gets stabbed. Cries out, Elbert Cathonio, wakes up, everybody's back to normal. But now he's got a piece of a broken sword stuck in his arm. And we get chapter 12, Flight to the Ford. He's sick. He can't take much. They make their way to the Ford of Berwinen. Um... They meet, I'm going to skip a bunch. They meet page 211, a little bit earlier, uh, 209. They meet Glorfindel. They do not meet Arwen, warrior princess. Why does Peter Jackson put Ar Arwen, warrior princess in there? Anybody know? She's prettier. That's debatable, okay, but maybe. Give a strong female character. Literally, he said, 
Some of the people who will come see my films will be women. I need someone they can relate to. Apparently seemingly completely unaware that there are two pretty strong female characters within the course of the novel, one of whom is named Eowyn and another one of whom is named Galadriel. And we will see Arwen towards the end of the novel, not as a warrior princess. Why? Because that's not how Tolkien creates her. She's not supposed to be that. We do have a quote-unquote warrior princess. For a while, at least. Okay? So, Glorfindel gives Frodo his horse. Frodo won't leave. Glorfindel has to speak to the horse, and the horse because they're being chased by the, uh, the Black Riders, makes its way across the fort of Bruenna. Page 214. What's so important about the fort of Bruenna? Well, it's on the other side. Rivendell. Rivendell. Okay. So, Frodo gets almost all the way to the other side of the river. And turns around and faces the Black Riders. All nine of them. They're now coming across. The captain of the nine has started riding his horse into the river. He's coming across. And Frodo cries out, go back, go back to the land of Mordor. Follow me no more. His voice sounded thin and shrill in his own ears. Why? Because he's fading. He's not wearing the ring, but he's fading. The riders halt, but Frodo had not the power of Bombadil. And they cry out, come back, come back. The ring. El uh, Frodo says, By Elbereth and Luthien the fair, you shall have neither the ring nor me. And then the captain of the nine stands up in his stirrups, raises his hand up. Frodo stops speaking. And notice what happens to the sword Frodo is carrying. It breaks. Now this is a sword woven with spells to help defeat him. Why can he just and the thing breaks? What's that showing us? His power is rising. He's getting stronger as Sauron gets stronger. What did Gandalf say in the Shadow of the Past? What is it Sauron needs? To have total control. The ring. Well, what could possibly also happen? This guy's Second in power slash command to Sauron. Can he make a play for it? Can he try to oppose Sauron? Probably not, but he could definitely oppose Frodo without any problem. So, Frodo, just before he passes out, sees that the water seems to turn into horses, and he sees on the other side of the river, now, light. Bottom of 214. He saw a shining figure of white light. Behind it ran small shadowy forms, waving flames. And then Frodo passes out. What's the shining figure of white light? Well, you have to then get to the next chapter. Many meetings. Frodo wakes up. And there's Gandalf. Sam's been there. Frodo's been asleep for a while. And Gandalf explains to him. Bottom of 222. Frodo says, is Rivendell safe? He says, yes. He says, um, here in Rivendell, there live still some of his chief foes, the elven wives, lords of the Eldar. They don't fear the ring wraiths. For those who have dwelt in the blessed realm, over here where the gods were, that is, there are some elves alive in Middle-earth who lived here for a while before the world was changed. If they've lived here, when they come back and live over here, it's like they live in both places simultaneously. Okay? I, I thought I saw a white light. Was that Glorfindel? Yes. You saw him as he is on the other side. Other side? In other words, you saw Glorfindel as he is without this stuff on. 
Remember that scene in um, Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, I think it's Empire Strikes Back. Frodo has gone off to Dagobah. Luke Skywalker has gone off to Dagobah. Yeah. Frodo went off to Dagobah and fired a phaser, you know, <laughs> putting all my Star Trek and Star Wars and Lord of the Rings together. Goes off to Dagobah and he's talking with Yoda. And Yoda and, and Frodo, Luke Skywalker says he can't do what Yoda can do. And Yoda tells him, I think it actually might be the next one. Yoda tells him, you know, mm, celestial beings we are. Not this crude matter. And he squeezes his cheeks in Frodo's uh, Luke Skywalker's arm. Why? Yoda is saying there. This stuff is inhibiting. It is containing what? The real light that lay within. Kind of like Glorfindel. Okay? He is an elf lord of a house of princes. There is a power in Rivendell to withstand the might of Mordor for a while. Not for eternity, but for a while. Okay? So... We go on, and we're going to skip the rest of many meetings, and we go to Chapter 2, the Council of Elrond. Okay? So Frodo's invited. Sam shows up, because you're not going to be able to separate Sam. And what happens in the Council of Elrond? That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a council. It is not like in the ridiculous film, where everybody's yelling at each other, and Gimli pulls out his axe to try to just, just sheer nonsense. So what's the council? Elrond says... You were all called here, but I didn't call you. So if they're called, who did the calling? Gandalf. Did Gandalf? Gandalf emailed the dwarves and say, Glowing, bring Gimli. Got some news for you about the little request Sauron's been sending you. Uh-uh. So there's a power, Frodo, behind the power of the maker of the ring. Bilbo was meant to have the ring, and so were you. That is what did the calling. Okay, so we get a bunch of people introduced. We meet Kyrdan the shipwright. We meet Legolas from the Northern Elves. We meet Glorfindel. We meet Boromir, etc., etc. So Gloin tells them about the messengers that have come from Mordor to the dwarves. And that's when 242. Elrond says, you've done well to come. You'll hear today all that you need in order to understand the purposes of the enemy. There's nothing you can do other than resist, with hope or without it. But you don't stand alone. He's talking there specifically to the dwarves. Guess what? You, you don't have any hope of winning. But you can resist. And you're not alone. We'll send aid. Okay? You will learn that your trouble is but part of the trouble of all the Western world. What's that trouble? The ring, the trifle that Sauron fancies. That is the purpose for which you are called hither. Called, though I haven't called you. You have come and are here met in this very nick of time. Meaning, maybe just in time. Okay? So, Elrond speaks first. And what does he tell them about? Sauron and the making of rings. He tells them about the last great alliance of elves and men. Okay? And he says, I was there when Sauron got the ring cut from his finger. Okay? Page 243. Frodo, whoa, 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 stop. You remember? But I, I, I thought it was ages ago. He goes, yeah, it was. My memory reaches back even to the elder days. Arendil was my sire. That's the Arendil that Tolkien creates from that, when I wrote up the other day, I think first or second day here, Eala Arendil, that old English verse. He says, that guy was my father. Also, let me give you a little genealogy lesson. He was my father, who was born in Gondolin before its fall. My, fa my mother was Elwing, daughter of Dior, son of Luthien of Doria. So if Dior was the son of Luthien of Doriath, whose husband was Baron. Elrond is saying, I am a descendant of Baron and Luthien. 
That's why he's called half elven. His great 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 grandfather was human. His great 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 grandmother actually wasn't even elf. She was part goddess. Well, she was elf. Her father was Luthien's father was an elf. Her mother was one of these creatures, which is a subset of those. Think of these as high-ranking angels, and these are low-ranking angels. His great-great-great-grandmother was one of these. Okay? So he says, yeah, I remember all that. So Boromir bursts in. Right. Says some stuff. Elrond says, don't worry, Boromir. All your problems, all your questions will be solved. Boromir recounts his story. Pages 246, 47. Recounts a little poem. The little poem talks about Isildur's bane. And the halfling. And Aragorn stands up and says... And here in the house of Elrond, more shall be made clear to you. Here's the sword that was broken. And he throws it on the table. Now, the sword that was broken, what would that be akin to in our world? Assuming it's not broken. The spear. Cross, spear, no. Think of a sword. Excalibur. Excalibur. Arthur's sword. Okay. Tolkien just changes it a little bit by having it broken. Why? So he can remake it. That's it. He says, this is Isildur's slash Elendil's sword. This is King Arthur's sword, essentially. Yeah? Who are you? Boromir asks. Well, who is Aragorn? According to Sam, according to Mary and Pippin, he's Strider. He's a guy who walks along on the long legs that he has and looks dirty and smelly and kind of unkempt most of the time. Okay, Notice who comes to his defense. Not like in the film. Because in the film, Elrond and Aragorn, man, they're having issues. <laughs> Elrond says, He is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and he is descended through many fathers from Isildur, Elendil, son of Minas Ithil. That is... He is what in waiting? He's king of Gondor. What's Boromir? In waiting. Steward in waiting. Steward in waiting. Why do you have stewards? When the king's checked out for a while. So what happens to, to the steward, or the steward in waiting, when the king in waiting returns? Unemployed. Out of a job. So you see how Aragorn presents a threat to Boromir. Right? Frodo's like, oh, thank God, finally. It's yours! Here, take the ring. And you're, no, 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 you're not going to cop that off on me, he says. Nope. But Gandalf does say, Frodo, hold the ring up. Show everybody. And they all realize now this is what the problem is. And notice, last com comment I'll make. Page 247. Elrond says, Behold Isildur's bane, Boromir's eyes glinted. Throughout the Lord of the Rings, whenever Tolkien uses that verb, glinted, or glint, or glints, to describe somebody's eyes, you can be sure of one thing. That person is not thinking of puppies and fuzzy kitties and nice things. That person has evil in his or her mind at that moment. That is, that is always a sign. Always a sign of, I want it. Boromir sees the ring, and he wants it. Why? What's his job? Not steward. What does he normally do? He's a soldier. What is the ring for a soldier? It is the biggest, best weapon you can get. Take a, a Barrett M50 and you know, extrapolate. I mean, this is this is the mother of all weapons, so to speak. 
All right, we'll stop there. Um, finish. Just finish. For Friday, the Fellowship of the Ring. We're going to, we, we got to zoom along. I don't know that we will, but we would finish. And I've decided, I'm, I don't.